In the early hours of November 5, 1983, four saturation divers and two tenders aboard an oil rig experienced one of the biggest disasters in the world of diving, the Biford Dolphin Accident. Discover the untold secrets of an ill-fated drilling rig, uncover shocking medical revelations, and dive into the investigation that sought justice for those who lost their lives. Brace yourself for a gripping underwater adventure you won't soon forget. The Biford Dolphin was a type of drilling rig used for drilling oil and gas wells in the North Sea. It belonged to a company called Dolphin Drilling, which was part of Fred Olson Energy. The rig operated during specific times of the year for different companies in the British, Danish, and Norwegian parts of the North Sea. It was officially registered in Hamilton, Bermuda, but it was taken apart and recycled in 2019. The Biford Dolphin was quite large, measuring 354 feet long, 221 feet wide, and 120 feet deep. It could drill down to a maximum depth of 20,013 feet and could work in water that was up to 1,509 feet deep. Even though the Biford Dolphin had engines of its own that could help it move around and stay in one place, it couldn't travel long distances on its own. When it needed to be taken to a new location far away, special boats called tugboats had to come and help move it. These tugboats were experts at moving big and heavy things like the Biford Dolphin across the water. In the beginning, the Biford Dolphin followed all the important rules and regulations set by the Norwegian government. This meant that it had proper certifications and met high standards for safety and performance. However, as time went on, the Biford Dolphin faced some problems. It was no longer allowed to operate in the waters of Norway because it didn't meet the new rules that were put in place. These rules were designed to make sure the rig was safe and wouldn't cause any harm to the environment. During this incident, there were a total of six people involved. Two of them were British saturation divers named Edwin Arthur Coward, age 35, and Roy P. Lucas, age 38. The other two divers were Norwegians named Bjorn Gavr Bergersen, age 29, and Truls Helvik, age 34. They were also saturation divers who worked alongside the British divers. Just like their British counterparts, they had the necessary skills and expertise to carry out their duties underwater. Apart from the divers, there were two more individuals, William Crammond, age 32, and Martin Saunders. These individuals were known as tenders, and they were responsible for operating and managing the equipment and machinery that supported the saturation divers' work. Their role was crucial in ensuring the smooth functioning of the diving operations. Let's get to know the specifics of their job roles. Saturation divers are highly skilled professionals who specialize in diving very deep into the ocean, often reaching depths of 500 feet or even greater. Their main job is to maintain and repair equipment found on offshore oil rigs and underwater pipelines. This type of diving requires tremendous bravery and determination, as well as a great deal of hard work. In return for their expertise, saturation divers receive a substantial salary, typically ranging from $30,000 to $45,000 per month. Working as a saturation diver can be quite dangerous due to the demanding nature of the job and the confined spaces in which they operate. Unlike many other divers who spend just a few hours underwater before returning to the surface, saturation divers often remain submerged for as long as 28 days on a single assignment. During this time, they live in cramped and pressurized chambers, which can be uncomfortable for those who feel claustrophobic. These chambers serve as their living quarters where they eat, sleep, and rest between their shifts. Unlike recreational divers who take their time ascending slowly with frequent breaks to safely decompress, saturation divers have a different method. If they were to follow the same technique, it would take them several days to reach the surface. Instead, saturation divers have a unique process to safely return to the surface. To begin with, they are transported from the deep sea to the surface using special pressurized diving bells. These bells provide a controlled environment during the ascent. Once they reach the surface, the divers are transferred to specialized decompression chambers. These chambers are designed to gradually reduce the high pressures experienced at great depths and allow the divers' bodies to adjust safely. 
For every 100 feet that a saturation diver descends, they must spend approximately one day in the decompression chamber. Inside the chamber, the divers can relax and rest on cots provided for their comfort. The work of saturation diving requires the collective effort of an entire crew to ensure its success and safety. Various roles and responsibilities are fulfilled by different members of the team to make everything run smoothly. Life support technicians maintain the hyperbaric chamber, which is the pressurized living environment where the divers stay during the decompression process. They ensure that the air inside the chamber matches the air that the divers breathe underwater. The dive control team is in charge of operating the diving bell, which is the structure that is lifted and lowered using a crane. This bell serves as a means of transportation for the divers, taking them from the deep sea to the surface and vice versa. They also closely monitor the divers as they perform their tasks, ensuring their safety throughout the entire diving operation. In addition, some cooks prepare and serve meals to the divers who are confined in the living chamber. Another key group of workers is known as tenders. These individuals have a vital supporting role in the diving process. They assist in unspooling and retracting the umbilical, which is a thick line that contains air supply tubes and communication wires. The umbilical connects the divers to the surface, ensuring their access to necessary resources and constant communication. The tenders are responsible for handling and managing this crucial connection, thus playing a pivotal role in the diver's safety and success. Overall, the saturation divers heavily rely on the tender workers and their supervisors in the dive control team. On Saturday, November 5, 1983, at 4 a.m., an incident occurred in the Frigg gas field located in the Norwegian part of the North Sea. During that time, there were four divers inside a diving chamber system positioned on the drilling rig's deck. This diving chamber system was connected to a diving bell through a short passage called a trunk. The divers, Edwin, Roy, Bjorn, and Truls, were accompanied by two dive tenders, William and Martin, who provided assistance and support throughout the diving operation. On this fateful day, there were three decompression chambers present, numbered one, two, and an unused third chamber. These chambers were connected to a diving bell through a trunk, a passageway that allowed movement between them. To keep the connection sealed, a clamp was used, which was operated by experienced divers named William and Martin, who were dive tenders. At the time of the accident, Edwin and Roy, the two divers, were taking a rest inside Chamber 2. The pressure inside this chamber was maintained at a level of 9 atmospheres ATM. Meanwhile, William, one of the dive tenders, had just completed the task of connecting the dive bell to the living chambers. He then proceeded to safely transfer Bjorn and Truls, who had finished their dive, into the living chambers. To do this, the divers left their wet equipment in the trunk and climbed through it to reach Chamber 1. The usual steps that would have followed were as follows. First, the diving bell door, which was initially opened to the trunk, would be closed. Then the pressure inside the diving bell would be slightly increased to ensure a tight seal around the bell door. Next, the door of chamber 1, which was also open to the trunk, would be closed. After that, the trunk would be slowly depressurized until it reached a pressure of 1 atmosphere, which is the normal atmospheric pressure we experience on the Earth's surface. Finally, the clamp holding the diving bell and the chamber system together would be opened, allowing them to separate from each other. After the initial two steps were done, a mistake occurred when William accidentally opened the clamp that was supposed to keep the trunk sealed. This happened before Truls had a chance to close the door to the chamber. As a result, the chamber experienced an immediate and rapid decompression from a pressure of 9 atmospheres to the normal external pressure of 1 atmosphere. This sudden change caused the air inside the chamber system to rush out with tremendous force. It also led to the interior door of the trunk getting stuck, preventing it from closing properly. Due to the force of the decompression, the heavy diving bell was forcefully propelled, striking the two diving tenders. Tragically, all four divers lost their lives as a result of the accident. One of the dive tenders, William, was killed instantly, while the other tender, Martin, suffered severe injuries. 
Following the tragic incident, medical examinations were conducted on the remains of the four divers involved. One significant discovery was the presence of large quantities of fat in their major arteries, veins, and cardiac chambers. Additionally, fat was found inside their organs, circulating through their blood vessels. In simpler terms, it was revealed that three of the divers, namely Edwin, Roy, and Bjorn, experienced a process called boiling from the inside. This occurred when the nitrogen in their blood suddenly transformed into gas bubbles with great force, resulting in their immediate and unfortunate demise. However, the fate of the fourth diver, Trules, was even more gruesome. He was positioned in front of the partially open door to the living chamber when the sudden decompression took place. The immense pressure release caused his body to be forcefully sucked out through the narrow opening. The force was so intense that it tore open his body and expelled his internal organs onto the deck of the rig. It was an incredibly horrific and tragic end for Trules. The Accident Investigation Committee attributed the accident to human error, specifically the dive tender who opened the clamp. However, it remains uncertain whether the tender acted under the instruction of their supervisor, independently, or due to a communication breakdown. The tenders outside the chamber system relied solely on a bullhorn attached to the wall for communication, but the excessive noise from the rig and sea made it difficult to hear and understand what was happening. Additionally, the divers, who frequently worked exhausting 16-hour shifts, were affected by fatigue, which further contributed to the situation. The incident was also attributed to a failure in engineering. The outdated Biford Dolphin diving system, which was constructed in 1975, lacked crucial safety features such as fail-safe hatches, outboard pressure gauges, and an interlocking mechanism. These features would have prevented the trunk from being opened while the system was pressurized. Before the accident, Norsk Veritas had established a certification rule stating that connecting mechanisms between the bell and chambers should be designed in a way that prevents operation when the trunk is pressurized. This rule requires fail-safe seals and interlocking mechanisms in such systems. However, it was only a month after the accident that Norsk Veritas and the Norwegian Oil Directorate made this rule mandatory for all bell systems. The North Sea Divers Alliance, consisting of early North Sea divers and the families of those who lost their lives, persistently advocated for further investigation into the incident. In February 2008, they obtained a report revealing that the true cause of the accident was faulty equipment. After 26 years, the families of the divers finally received compensation from the Norwegian government for the damages incurred. This tragic event once again reminds us of the risks associated with diving. If under any circumstances, diving must be done, it's important for each diving operation to carefully analyze and assess risks to ensure the safety of divers. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting diving story.